Mi presentation is in English, so un poquito español. Next year, I try to come back and speak in Spanish. <laughs> so I, I did a uh, mejor manera de predictor el futuro es creato. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. That is the premise of my talk and really how um, Java developers have the opportunity to create the future of Java and the legal I have to show you. And so I'm here from California. It's my second time in Mexico City. Many times to Mexico before, but I was here in Mexico City last year for your Java Day event. So I'm happy to be back here in Mexico City again. I've worked on the um, Java platform since 2000, so since the Java 1.2 release back at Sun Microsystems. So I'm going on two decades of working with the Java developer community. And you really are the reason that I've stayed with this uh, job effort for so long uh, because the Java community is so passionate. I do have the opportunity to travel all over the world meeting with Java developers and helping them to see how their work and what they do every day is important and be able to contribute back their their experiences, their use cases, their wishes, their desires, and showing them the way that they can do that. There really is no other technology platform that is developed in quite the same way that Java is that provides that type of opportunity for you. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the landscape of the Java developer um, marketplace, as well as the role of developers as our IT industry is changing as our world economy is changing. And then I'll talk to you about um, changes that have happened over the last year in the Java community, what you can expect to see coming next in the Java platform itself, and how you can get more involved, either through your user group or through your employer or as an individual developer, what you can do to influence the future of Java. So since uh, we're coming up on 20 years of celebrating the JCP being in existence in my role as the chairperson and director of the Java community process, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the overall landscape of um, the IT world. So what are the in-demand skills and how does the World Economic Forum see those changing? And I just compared um, from five years, in, the, in a five year time period, what they say is that in-demand skills are gonna be increasingly requiring skills um, that require a little bit more emotional intelligence. Um, so skills that require more human interaction, complex thinking, building relationships. And these are the types of skills that you need practice to develop. They're not the kind of skills that you can develop from reading about them in a book. So it's a little bit different than some of the technical skills. But even if you look at specifically the role of the developer, also it's changing as we move into the fourth industrial revolution. Increasingly about half the time, um, even technical roles, employers are expecting them to spend their time on more types of activities that involve communication, critical thinking, um, teamwork, collaboration with people not only in their local community but worldwide, and being able to take some leadership positions. And again, the types of activities that you're in here today as well as participating in the Java community, that's where you're gonna be able to acquire these types of skills that as developers, obviously you need to keep your technical skills relevant and, and continue to build on those and learn the latest technologies, but also differentiate yourself based on communication, leadership, collaboration. Those are ideal ways to make yourself stand out as a developer on your team, in your local community, in the worldwide global Java community. So just a few suggestions here on, on where you might want to gain those skills. And I'm gonna obviously go into a, a little bit more detail as I go through my presentation on how you can develop these skills in addition to keeping on top of what the latest developments in the technology are. So that's looking at it from the skills perspective. From the technology perspective, also things are changing. So we're in a polyglot environment now. It's no longer, oh, I'm a Java developer and I don't need to learn any other technologies or tools. I do just code Java. Um, that's not the environment that we're in anymore. Um, increasingly, developers need to um, be familiar with multiple tools and languages and frameworks, and that changes every day. But one thing that remains constant over the last 20 plus years is that Java is still the number one programming language. So being 
that you're at a Java developer conference, uh, you're in a good space here. Um, Java continues to be number one, and some of the things that's coming next in the platform that I'm going to talk to you about, some of the technical things that are coming out in the Java platform are only going to solidify Java's position as the number one programming language. And we continue to see the Java programming language grow in terms of number develop developers over the world, 12 million, but also looking at how we can make Java the ideal platform for the cloud. And you see those numbers continuing to grow as well in the billion billions range. So why is that? And I think there's some particular reasons that Java remains number one, and it's, as I mentioned in the beginning, the way Java de is developed through the community. Um, being key as a differentiator, but also the philosophies that we use as we develop Java. So having that platform completeness, maintaining a focus on the quality and security of the platform, which will continue moving forward, but also especially the changes that we've made over the last year and as we look at changes to um, incorporate into the platform, bring, making it more modern, increasingly bringing in the innovation at a more rapid pace, but also continuing to bring in that active ecosystem involvement while continuing to focus on compatibility as a core premise moving forward and ensuring that we have that entire ecosystem based on the one Java premise. So these things will continue to be important moving, moving forward, but I think also looking at why Java is number one, these are the reasons why, and these values or philosophies have remained consistent over time. And a big part of that is overseen by the Java community process. You would say that I'm a little bit biased in saying that because that's the focus of my role in my day-to-day -day life is ensuring the success and continuing participation in the Java community process. Um, but what you can see if you look over time is that there have been a lot of changes that the Java community has been able to adapt to and evolve and continue to see Java be number one. And a lot of that is overseen by the Java community process. Is anyone familiar with what the Java community process is? I'll just take a show of hands. Has anyone ever heard of the Java community process? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a 10-minute primer on what is the Java community process. Has anybody heard about any changes in the ecosystem or the way Java is being developed or things um, that have changed over the last 12 to 18 months in the um, developer community around Java? Okay, so... I'll tell you all about that too. Is anyone a member of a Java user group? Okay, and I'm also going to tell you about that. So uh, we're, I'm going to go right into that part right now. Um, so Java is overseen by an organization called the Java Community Process. So what that means is that Java is not defined solely by any one particular vendor. Um, so that means that um, Oracle, for instance, can't do whatever it wants with Java, right? Any changes that are put into the Java platform are overseen by the organization, the JCP. And the Java community process has an executive board of which I'm the chairperson. But the main bulk of the work in the JCP to develop the JSRs, so the Java platform itself that is made up of many JSRs, um, which come from the JEPS in the OpenJDK project, are led by members of the community. So for instance, in the case of the Java SE platform, Oracle is a spec lead, but there are many other community members that also contribute to that. And before anything can be put into a final shipping Java product, it needs to be approved and ratified by the JCP executive committee. So every JSR um, has a specification, a reference implementation, and a TCK. Has anyone ever heard of a JSR? Has anyone ever heard of a, has anyone ever heard of a an RI? The reference implementation. Has anyone ever heard of Java SE? Okay. What what technology are you are you the JDK? Are you developing on the JDK? No, no one here is. Okay. I kind of wonder what you're doing in my talk. Okay. No Java developers in the room. Is that what you're telling me? Who's a Java developer? <laughs> okay. okay, we have three Java developers in the room. All right. Awesome. What are the rest of you doing? Who's a tester? <laughs> Documentation, user interface, design. Should I just assume that you're all just reluctant to say you're a Java developer? 
because you're laughing. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you're if you're using Java SE or the JDK, you're essentially using technologies that are developed as JSRs. So those are the projects that are overseen by the Java community process. And every project follows the same cycle and has open development review periods that have to be approved by the board, the executive committee. And every member of the JCP itself can participate on the expert groups of those JSRs. Um, but more importantly, even people who aren't members of the JCP program itself can actually comment and give feedback to the spec leads and expert group members that are working on those JSRs without being any type of member. So giving your feedback. So that's what I alluded to at the beginning, how Java's different than other technologies. So Java is different in that we solicit feedback from the community, um, whether or not you're a member or not. And again, it's not overseen by one particular vendor, right? It's a whole ecosystem of companies and individuals that are depending on Java or building their businesses on Java or developing their products and applications on Java. So those three things in the JSR work together. So there is a specification. So all the documentation that you use in your Java product projects, probably you've at least referenced the specification. That's what's unique also about Java, that is that it's required every single technology have a complete and approved specification. Documentation's not optional or an afterthought, it's a requirement. And then the reference implementation is the code. So OpenJDK, for instance, is the reference implementation for Java SE. So you have to have that code um, that complies with the specification. It's written to the specification. And then the other part of it that enables this ecosystem is the test suite or a TCK. So that means that the reference implementation has to pass, pass the test suite. That means that there can be multiple compatible implementations, so not just the reference implementation, other members of the Java community can build their own implementation based on the specification and then run it against the technology compatibility test suite, the TCK, and certify themselves as Java, as a Java um, compatible implementation. So that's what enables the vast amount of choices that you have as a Java developer. The fact, and the fact that you'll be able to switch in between different products, application servers, those type of things. That's all based on this compatibility triangle. That's the foundation of the Java ecosystem, the ability to have multiple implementations that are based on the same technology um, and all, um, based on the same specification. So it provides you with compatibility, the complete specification, as well as a implementation of reference that you can go back to. And this is an international effort. We have members of the Java community from over 80 countries participating in the standardization effort around Java. Um, fortunately, I've been able to visit people in almost every region and get their particular feedback. And what I find is that while many things are unique, especially in the culture and language, and sometimes even in the uses um, and applications of the technology, there's so much that we all still have in common. Um, but there's different types of members too. We have not only the corporations, so the big corporations and vendors, um, people using Java and building their businesses on Java, but also nonprofit and open source groups. Um, since Java has been available under an open source license now for over 13 years, open source is a key part of the Java community as well. In addition to Java user groups, we have close to 400 different Java user groups all around the world, and we enable their participation in the JCP effort. And then passionate individual Java developers. Oftentimes, folks are building their consulting business as an individual developer on Java, and they want to participate in this process as well. So our executive committee is made up of a backdrop of all of these different types of people, corporations, nonprofit groups, Java user groups, and individual developers. So everything that goes into the Java platform must be approved by the executive committee before it can be put into products or projects to be used in production. Um, so we have about, it's a 25 member EC now. We have. Um, not only vendor corporations, but also some end user corporations. People are heavily using Java like Twitter and banks like BNY Mellon and Credit Suisse and also nonprofits like the Eclipse Foundation and Java user groups. 
And what these people have found is that participating in this effort uh, really provides them an advantage in their career. Um, if they're a company, also provides them an, an advantage in being able to develop their implementations more quickly and alongside and also putting in their um, requirements for the technology early rather than waiting until it's all finished. And as I alluded to earlier, it's open standards and open source. So what that means is Java is developed in an open way with the standards, like I talked about having the specifications, we believe that that still is very key and important to the success of Java and ensuring the compatibility, but also the fact that it's available via open source license. So that means all of the JSRs and the Java development work is happening for at least the reference implementation in an open source project. So what that looks like um, for the Java SE platform, for instance, is that the reference implementation is developed as an open source project in OpenJDK, and that feeds up into the JCP for ratification before it can be finalized. So that is my 10 minute primer on what is the JCP. Uh, so now I can focus on the three things I told, I told you I would tell you about, which are the new revisions of the Java platform, uh, things that have happened and rolled out in the last year, how we're changing the JCP as an organization to adapt to these new um, increased cadence and some of the other changes, as well as how you can participate in the community. So traditionally, um, we had multiple Java platforms being developed through the JCP. Um, Java EE, Java the Enterprise Edition, uh, the last version of Java EE was Java E8, and that was um, developed and released through the JCP program in September 2017. Um, that is the current version of Java Enterprise Edition made up of several different component technologies that was developed in an open source project called Project Glassfish. Uh, the community has decided to migrate that technology into the Eclipse Foundation, so moving forward, any Java EE-based technologies, um, such as JAXRS, a CDI, those types of technologies, um, Java server faces, anybody use any of these technologies I'm naming off? Enterprise, yeah. Okay, so those were previously defined through JSRs to the GCP. That's migrating to the Eclipse Foundation. So the Eclipse Foundation will call those technologies moving forward Jakarta EE. Um, and you can uh, get involved and participate in that evolution of the Java Enterprise platform moving forward. But the current uh, version of Java Enterprise Edition that's currently available is Java E8 that was released in September 2017. The main focus of the JCP will continue to be Java SE, so the Java Standard Edition, um, which is developed through OpenJDK. So the reference implementation is developed there in OpenJDK. It's developed and managed up through a process of Java enhancement proposals, or JEPs, and those feed up into JSRs. So the Java SE platform, the last major release is Java 12. Um, I usually ask here which Java platform version you're using. Um, I'll, I'll just try and see if any, who's using Java SE 8 currently in production? Who's using something below Java SE 8 in production? Okay, so a lot of you aren't in production, I guess, with Java. Anybody using anything above Java 8 in production? A few of you. Okay, so it's actually a pretty balanced representation. I know we have a lot of people that aren't participating in my polls, but we have some people who are prior to Java 8, some people on Java 8, some people beyond Java 8. Um, what I think we've found in the community is that um, a lot of folks are still, are predominantly on Java 8, um, but we're now on the last major release platform at Java 12 currently. Did anyone know we were at Java 12 at the moment? No, okay, it's a good thing that I'm here. Uh, okay, and so, um, so what we announced with um, Java 9 back in 2017, Java 9 was um, a big change introduced into the Java community, so right, Project Jigsaw completed, and that was 
Project Jigsaw was about modularity, but and that was Java 9, but Java 9 was actually about much more than Project Jigsaw and modularity. Um, but also at that time, we introduced the idea of a faster release cadence to accelerate application development, right? So that means that rather than as a Java developer expecting a new release of Java every three or four years, which you're probably used to, we're gonna introduce a new version of Java every six months starting in September 2017. Um, and what that means is that the releases are no longer about any one big project, right? So we don't pick, say, Lambdas or Jigsaw, and we say we're gonna finish this new feature and we're not gonna release the next version of Java until it's ready. We don't do it that way anymore. That's the old way of doing things. That's back to what I was talking about, modernizing the platform, right? So we'll do it in a more agile, agile continuous delivery model where whatever's ready in six months is ready. And that means that you can get new innovations as they develop without having to wait for the rest of the project to be ready. But that also means a change in the way that Java developers think about moving from one release to the next. It means that you develop and download early access releases as they become available, maybe every two weeks, every month, and you test your applications against it, and you evaluate whether you're gonna move to that new release or not, and it becomes fewer changes being introduced in between Java releases where versus 100 new feature functionality in each Java platform release. Now you have maybe 10 or 15 changes being introduced in between platform releases. So rather than as a development team, you have a big project of three, four months or longer to migrate between Java versions, it becomes a process of doing it on a more continuous basis, um, migrating to the latest version. So that's, a ch that's one of the changes that I talked about in terms of what's new in the Java developer community. So not only the change of the migration from Java EE, but also a new release cadence and model with Java. And I'll go into a little bit more details about that. But what that looks like is new releases every six months, um, but it also means that we also introduce this idea or concept of a long-term support release, which the Java community didn't previously have, but communities like the Linux uh, community have had for a very long time. So faster release cycle cadence every six months, and then long-term support releases every three years. Uh, so the new release model, mean, that means that the, the last um, update for eight came out just this year, and the next long-term support release is Java 11, but we're now already releasing Java 12, right? Java 12 is the new version. We're already working on 13, and the next long-term support version of Java will be 17. Uh, so coming out three years away, a long-term support model, so six platform releases away would be Java 17, that would be the no next long-term support release. So that means that there are at least uh, two security patches for every release coming out. Um, and then there's the long-term support available. And of course, that also means that there's no longer anymore just one JDK, right? That increases the idea that there's other options for developers to have. Obviously, Oracle provides their uh, version, Oracle, uh, JDK, um, obviously they have a long-term history and deep engineering resources to support that, but there also are other community members who are stepping up and offering support um, for the long-term support releases. So that also is a new change being introduced into the community. And then at the same time, there used to be um, some commercial features that were part of the Oracle JDK that Oracle committed to open sourcing. So that means now that there's very little technical difference between Oracle's JDK and Open JDK, and that was a process, but at this point we're finished with that as of Java 11, so that means that um, we got some new cool features um, available in Open JDK that were previously Oracle proprietary features, and even some Oracle customers you know, hadn't used some of these features before because they weren't sure how they were going to be supported moving forward, but now that they're part of Open JDK, I think we'll see some more adoption in these types of fe um, features, particularly around um, the flight recorder and mission control, some really cool features and functionality that are now available in the Java 11 release. And obviously, everything that was in um, Java 11 it 
also is in Java 12, which is the current release, in addition to a few extra things. So I'm going to kind of break down what's in the last releases from 9, 10, 11, 12, and then what you can look at in 13 moving forward to give you an idea of what's to come in the landscape, but also since it's, it is common in most of the communities I visit, and it seems to be consistent here, a lot of you haven't really looked much at the technology beyond Java 8. So again, back to the philosophies and investments, these are the things that we're looking at from a technical perspective as we evolve OpenJDK. Security, maintaining our n number one priority, so that will continue to be number one, um, but also looking at um, solving some Java developer problems in terms of productivity, um, increasing density, improving startup time and predictability, and also simplifying serviceability and profiling. So um, with Java 9, as I talked about, that was in a big way about modularity, but also it had over 100 other new features. I list 100 new features as well as show you the list here, not that I think you can read this list, but just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, so once you, get, once you get past Java 9, you're looking at more incremental changes to the platform, right? Um, but there, I know there, there were a lot of changes that were introduced, and we did take a look at um, how the community, the tools, the libraries, the IDEs were coming along, and I think we've made great progress in terms of the community stepping up and getting ready to be on Java 9 and be available. That's why there was this uh, hashtag works fine on JDK 9, so you can see which tools are and libraries and IDs are available. Um, we've made really good progress there. I think um, you can uh, take a look and see which, I know a few of you I already talked to earlier waiting for a couple things to move past Java 8, but I think the ecosystem has really come a long way in terms of supporting Java 9. It really is a lot more, a lot a lot more than modularity, but one significant thing with Java 9 is that it really did create that platform for us to be able to move in a lot more agile way and break the platform into pieces to be able to move in a more, um, at a faster release cadence every six months. So that really freed us from having that more um, waterfall type development cycle of every new release every three to four years. So while you may or may not like um, how modularity was implemented, that really is a key thing to ensuring the modernization and success of Java moving forward. So looking at Java 10, that was released in 2018. It was the first release to come six months after Java 9. And to give you an idea of what was in that, 12 new enhancement proposals. So 12 versus 100. That gives you an idea of the scale with the new six month release cadence. So that means that as things were ready in the OpenJDK projects, they were implemented. I think one of the more interesting things that developers get excited about with um, Java 10 and what that introduced was um, the var keyword. Um, and then with Java 11 in September 2018 being the first long-term support release, so-called, um, you had 17 JEPs. Um, so again, you know, great uptake from the community. All the IDs, IDEs were available on Java 11 within the first day. Um, so I think the efforts that we've made in working with the community have really ensured um, that we're getting the community used to this cadence and being ready to migrate to the next version. Um, with Java 11, um, you can see that there were 17 new features, even though we initially thought there would only be um, four, so some cool things went into that. Um, Java 12 um, released just last month in March, uh, so that's available today. Um, you can view uh, and download the last release of Java on OpenJDK. Um, that was released in March, so that means that Java 13 will be available in September of this year, and early access builds are already out for that. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, there's early access builds available on OpenJDK uh, that come out every two weeks. Uh, so you can see here, uh, I, we don't have the JEPs targeted yet for 13, but there are several projects that we're looking at for evaluation to be part of Java 13. Uh, so you can follow along with any particular ones that are of interest to you. 
I'm going to highlight some of the some of the projects that are the most popular and having the most activity in OpenJDK at this point. Um, I'll go through each one of these in a little bit bit of detail. Um, I just mapped it here to some of the projects for your particular interest. So what I encourage you to do is if you see something here that you think would be of particular interest to you in improving your application development and your productivity to kind of take a note of what these projects are. So mapping them to the problems, right? These are the projects we're gonna look at solving those problems and where you might wanna get involved in the mailing list um, or downloading the builds for that particular project. Okay, so starting with Project Valhalla. Uh, so that's about object data layout. Um, creating value types in Java. So um, this is something that we haven't seen a lot of things come out of yet and developed into the Java platforms, but I think it's something that you're gonna start looking at in 13 and beyond. Some of the things from this project will be implemented. Um, so they're still in the, er the earlier phases of Project Valhalla. So if this is something that you have experience with and have some things that you can contribute to the discussion, it would be a good idea to go to OpenJDK and participate in the Project Valhalla mailing list. Project Portola is a focusing on containers. So I know this is a really hot topic with many developers. So Project Portola is making Java the ideal candidate for container um, deployment in, in the cloud. Um, project Portola um, is also a project currently open in OpenJDK where you can join the mailing list and contribute that to that discussion. Project Panama is another one that is a big area of interest for developers, particularly around big data and machine learning. So we're learning uh, how to improve Jada's, Java's, Java's native interoperability, so going native with Java. Um, this is a particularly interesting topic that we just talked about in the last executive committee meeting. And uh, Brian Getz, who's an architect on the Java team, uh, made some slides available going into some of the solutions that they're looking at in terms of how we might do this and build it into the Java platform moving forward. Project Loom is another one um, that's going on, um, looking at how to spawn millions of fibers into a single JVM instance. Um, so an easier and more scalable concurrency model. Um, so we haven't changed too much around that for quite a while, so that's Project Loom, another one that's currently ongoing in OpenJDK. And then finally, uh, Project Amber. So Project Amber is similar to um, what we used to have with Project Coin, looking at some uh, language improvements. Maybe they're a little bit smaller that don't uh, need their whole entire project on their own. Um, so some of the things that they're looking at there are wrong, rostering literal switch expressions and pattern matching. Those are some of the projects going on in Project Amber. So it's really like a collection of smaller language improvements. Uh, it's another one that you can get involved in. And then as I mentioned earlier, you can download the complete early access builds. So this means before they're final. Um, so currently what's available and ready is Java 12, that's the latest release, but you also can get early access builds for JDK 13, as well as some of the projects have their own project specific downloads available. So for instance, Project Panama and Project Valhalla um, have project specific downloads available for you. So if you go to jdk.java.net, that's the place where you can download either the latest ready for use uh, Java build in, that you can use in production or take a look at some of those early access builds. So when you look at the early access builds or the project builds, you're saying you're getting yourself ready for the releases that might be coming soon that you might start using in production. So that's a way um, for you to have the early access for you not only to test your applications and get the feedback for yourself, but also ways that you could feed 
give your feedback um, to the project leads before the projects are finalized. So that's what the early having the early access builds available enables you to do. It gets you ready um, for one thing on your side, but then it also provides you with that opportunity to communicate with people and share maybe the experiences that you're having. So what you can do when you do that is you're either, you can get help uh, for one thing, or you can share your ideas and your feedback. So it really is how, um, Java continues to evolve is through the participation of the community. So you can get involved uh, by going to OpenJDK. Um, there's a process there for how you would get involved and how you would become a contributor to start with. Um, there's an application for that on OpenJDK. You can also get updates on Twitter. If you're a Twitter Twitter user, uh, OpenJDK, you can follow that for that specific project. One of the questions I also get often is around Java training and certifications. So since the last training and certification that was available was for Java 8, that was now quite a while ago, right? And as I mentioned, we're already on Java 12, so just recently uh, Oracle did update their Java training and certifications, so Java SE 11 training and certification programs are now available, um, and um, those will continue to be evolved, but the current one that's available is for Java 11. Uh, and there's currently a discount for Java user group members, so 25% off discount if you're a Java user group member. So if you go to the website, it, it talks about that as well if you're interested in getting um, training on the last changes to the platform itself. So with all of these changes in the community, we also have to look at how the JCP will change to adapt and support the platform's evolution moving forward. And we do that uh, with the cooperation of the executive committee. Uh, so we've had a multi-step process to do this. First of all, making everything transparent and available to you, the community, right? That means that things shouldn't happen behind closed doors. All of the examples that I just gave you about OpenJDK, we've mandated that in the process rules of the JCP that, that everything needs to open on ma mailing lists that are open, downloads need to be open and accessible to the public without having to be a member of any particular community, whether you're a member of the JCP or a member of the OpenJDK community. So first we made that change, and then we also looked at uh, the makeup of the executive board itself, the executive committee. Um, less oversight by the executive committee, less um, overhead and governance. So looking at s streamlining the executive committee that itself, as well as making it a little bit smaller, more agile, is another thing that we took a look at and implemented. And then thirdly, looking at how we can increase participation and, and enable the JSRs to move through the JCP process faster. So increased participation and moving faster. And by doing that, we're looking at ways that we can broaden membership in the JCP, making it not just about companies and corporations, but also embracing user group members, individual developers, and open source groups. We do that by eliminating barriers that there might be to participation, whether that's fees, so we no longer have membership fees, um, we process the agreements electronically versus downloading and printing and scanning, and then also adding different types of memberships. Um, so simplifying the actual agreements themselves rather than the multiple pages um, getting down to one or two pages for an agreement. Um, and that means no, one size no longer fits all for the type of membership to participate in the standardization efforts. So that means that we have associate members for individuals, partner members for Java user groups and open source groups, and then we continue to have the full members for people who want to lead JSRs, serve on a JSR expert group, um, and be on the executive committee. So those are more of a commitment, and obviously we have to go into a lot more details in the agreement, um, but also creating those lighter weight membership agreements and contributor um, agreements for people who want to make more of a lighter weight commitment, um, spend less time and resources and contribute less intellectual property. We have those other types of memberships now available in the JCP. And then also our JSR lifecycle model. So I didn't show our lifecycle earlier, but 
really um, the, the JSR life cycle model for the JCP was created in a time when water, the waterfall um, development of software was more prevalent. And now we're um, developing all of the JSR projects in open source projects. So a lot of that doesn't really make sense. It's more about an open development period rather than discrete deliverables. So we've evolved and changed to streamline the JSR lifecycle process as well. Um, so that means rather than multiple um, discrete um, frozen milestones, you have open development periods, again, where everything's open to the public for continuous comments and feedback, but then still freezing the content at a certain point, so you have to have that for the executive committee to actually vote on it and approve it. Um, but not having them do that throughout the life cycle, waiting until it's almost ready to be finalized, and then having the executive committee basically ratify it and ensure that what the changes that have been implemented to become part of the next version of the Java platform are taking into account the needs of the entire Java community and aren't just about any one particular vendor. So what that means is less votes by the executive committee, um, less discrete milestones for spec leads and expert groups to deliver for posting on jcp.org, but more openness and availability and opportunity really for the Java community to be able to provide feedback during that initial open development period. So it's kind of balancing the needs of less overhead on the spec leads, um, still having the oversight of the executive committee, but really trying to bring in that contribution and feedback from the Java um, community itself, whether they're members of the Open JDK community or the JCP community itself, but enabling them to have that opportunity to provide feedback. And we'll continue to evolve things over time, um, but that's where we are now in terms of the um, life cycle and creating a JCP that's more open than it was before when it was first introduced back in a time when open source development wasn't the de facto model for developers um, developing and consuming software and waterfall versus now a little bit more agile and um, continuous delivery type of model for the Java developer community. So that leaves us with the last part of my presentation, which is how will you participate and how will we get your feedback into the platform as it develops? And what we've found with um, some different um, programs that we've worked uh, with the community is that individual um, feedback is okay, that works fine, um, but if you work as part of a team, so whether that be with members of your community, members of your development team and, and your employer, you're gonna help each other, you're gonna teach each other about what you're learning as you're going through some of these projects, you're gonna work with each other and collaborate, but you're also gonna provide feedback to the leaders of the Java projects that are gonna be a little bit more valuable because you've had the time to discuss them with each other and get a little bit of different perspective that you'll have even within your own local community, some commonality of saying, this isn't one particular um, instance of an error happening or um, a use case that isn't being considered, but this is something that we're seeing often in our community and we want it to be considered. So carrying that weight of the feedback and the feedback really is critical to the success of Java because working together, we really can achieve more and working together with your Java user group, you can actually bring some of that awareness into your community. So Java user groups, I know most of you didn't raise your hands when I asked if you were a member of a Java user group, but a Java user group is a great opportunity to hear from people in your community and sometimes even international speakers about some of the um, new um, things being developed in the Java community or how they're using a Java technology. So what we found is working together with the Java user groups, having them be members of the JCP and contribute through um, the adopt a JSR program, working with a particular technology. They're helping um, to educate their own community, but also raising their awareness in terms of highlighting them in talks that I give like this all over the world, um, as well as in the Java platform um, product releases where we acknowledge certain user groups that have made significant contributions to the technology. Um, so it's helping the platform itself, it's also helping the local communities, it's helping 
members of the community develop some of those skills that I talked about early on in terms of the changing um, requirements and expectations of technical people working on Java development projects in terms of requiring more skills around leadership, uh, communication, collaboration. Um, this is really an ideal way to gain some of those skills. So I broke it down into some steps that you might wanna do if you wanna start get started in participating in some of these efforts. Um, five steps. First of all, you know, this is all maybe a little bit overwhelming. I talk about all these different things being developed, right? And that's kind of why I, I tried to um, put throughout my presentation, if you're interested in this, you might want to come back to or think about this. So pick one thing to start with, right? So pick a JSR, pick a project in OpenJDK, pick something either that you want to learn about or that you're using in your day-to-day -day life or that you collectively in your small team or in your Java user group or community of friends, you know, are interested in learning more about and contributing to. And I just listed there's a few standalone JSRs that are being developed through the JCP. And then, of course, there's the platform, which I spent the bulk of my time talking about today. Um, so the Java um, Visual Recognition JSR, JSR 381, um, Configuration JSR, um, there's a Desktop API, and then of course there's the Platforms as well as the Units of Measurement JSR. So there's different JSRs that you can view on jcp.org to see what's current, um, what your particular area of interest is, is. And the way we have it set up on jcp.org is that every JSR has a page that looks exactly the same. So you always know where to get the latest information. So the Java platforms all have pages. So for instance, Java SE 13 is the last, um, it's the most current JSR being developed for Java SE. It would have a same page like this. So you would go to the JSR numbered page. So for instance, for um, Java 13, it's JSR 388. You would go to JSR 388 on jcp.org, and there it would list the title as well as um, pointers to the last um, downloads that are available, but then underneath it has the public issue tracker and the discussion forum. So those are really the key places where you would go, download the latest draft, look at the discussion forum, look at the issue tracker. Those are some of the requirements that I talked about that we changed in the governance of the JCP, that this is all now required to be open and publicly accessible to anyone. Um, so that's where you can find a pointer to it. Um, if you wanna participate on the discussion list, anyone can read it, but if you did wanna actually provide some feedback, you would just need to join the list and then send your feedback to make sure it gets posted, but anyone can view the content that's on any of those. So that's the first step, pick, pick the technology, find the page, and then you know, review these, these three things, the latest draft downloads, the discussion forum, the issue tracker. Because you don't wanna be commenting on something that maybe was already discussed last month that just is not, a, it's not a good best practice, I guess you could say. So, but then you do wanna communicate, so that's really key, right? So you do wanna consume it first, read it, right? get up to speed with things that have been discussed, but you don't wanna stop there. Um, so while it's really important to review all that information, don't stop there. You want to communicate, right? So join the mailing list. Send a message on the mailing list. Hi, I'm introduce myself. This is what I work on. This is the community of people that we have together. We would like to contribute. Um, this, if you have any particular ideas, put them forward. If you're totally open, just open to doing whatever, say, I'd like to help out with this. Please let me know, you know how we can help. Communications, two-way street. Um, so make sure that you do that before you go off and pick something to do in terms of an action. Um, so decide, that's the next step that I advise. So decide on what actions you wanna take. Again, sometimes you might get um, suggestions from the leader, you might not, but at least you've you know, put it out there that you're interested in working on this. Um, so go if you don't have any suggestions of things that are needed, this is not by any means, you know, the list. It has to be on this list, and if it's not on this list, you don't do it. No, just a few suggestions of things that people have found helpful or useful, um, especially in the early stages of a technology, sharing your ideas. 
um, and, and comments on the list is helpful. Um, use cases is really helpful in the beginning, um, providing your examples. Um, reading those early versions, very few leaders get comments on the Java docs or specifications. And there's reason for this. It can be a little bit overwhelming. It can be hundreds of pages at some point. Um, you can comment on just a particular part of it, for instance. You could say, I'm providing you feedback on the specification. This particular part, this is what I think about this part. You don't need to feel like you need to take on the whole entire specification. Um, but that's something that oftentimes leaders aren't getting anyone volunteer from the community to do, so really helpful and useful. Um, once we have early access builds, so early access reference implementations, downloading those out and trying them and then not just stopping there, again, sharing what happened when you did that, right? Um, if it's a new technology, especially some of these standalone technology examples I gave you in the beginning, writing sample applications is something that some Java user groups have done for new um, functionality. Uh, sample applications that even can be included um, when the technology is finalized to help new developers who are getting up to speed with the technology. Or even translation, so um, de facto language for all of this is English, so there are certain communities where it's preferable, especially when you're learning something new, to have some tutorials um, or some of the documentation in local language. So that's something that can always be helpful. And then sharing within your local community. As you've learned about the technology, give a talk at a local meetup or user group. Even if you're not a member, oftentimes you're looking for talks. So that's a way to share what you've learned. Um, and, or even just you know micro, small things on Twitter, right? Sharing what you've learned. Documentation, of course, everyone also needs help with that. You kind of laughed. I guess we don't have any people doing that here. So always helpful, though. Comment on the issue tracker, right? So when you come up with something, provide that feedback in the issue tracker or on the mailing list, really key. Really key to have that feedback. And again, that's something that the executive committee looks at when they vote on the technologies. Is the project taking to, into account the feedback they get? They can't do that if we're not actually getting people giving feedback on the technology. And then fifth, um, participate in an activity. Organize an activity with your community. Have a hack day, um, even if it's virtual, um, even if it's at lunchtime um, at your employer, right? So get together and work on it together and share. This is a picture from uh, Code One last year in San Francisco. I think some people might even be here in the audience. Alberto is back there. Yeah, from Ecuador, he was there. Um, we did a uh, hacker garden in the exhibit area, so getting together, discussing the technologies, and gathering feedback, and having fun at the same time. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot of people to do that. That was probably larger. A lot of hack days, four or five people um, can be really productive and useful. But connecting people together and providing that feedback that you're using is really key. So I told you earlier, you can participate in OpenJDK. There is also a quality outreach group. So I mentioned that a lot of the commercial tools um, are ready and supporting the latest versions of Java. Some of the open source um, tools uh, need more help. So that's another place where community members can get involved. So there's actually a chart here on the um, quality outreach group that's part of the adoption group in OpenJDK. So there's a mailing list as well as a wiki. Um, so you can take a look at the project list there. There's over 100 projects there that are participating in the program. And it gives you a link to the leaders. So if you wanted to contribute to any of those projects, help them get up to speed on the latest version of Java, that's also an idea on how you can get involved and participate. Um, the adoption group has those early access builds as well. And the quality outreach, again, is more about open source projects and getting them up to speed. I put just a couple of examples here just to give you an idea. So like Eclipse Collections and Apache Maven are two different projects that are listed there on the quality outreach part of the adoption group in OpenJDK. Um, so you can find there, you know, the leads. Here's their picture. Just an example, like I said, there's over 100 projects there that you could choose from. Um, but these two particular project leaders have gotten a lot of um, feedback from the community and found that really helpful in terms of keeping up with the new faster release cadence. So you can join the JCP as well. I'll give you the links for how to do that. If you want to become a member of the JCP, you can also follow us on social media, um, JCP underscore org on Twitter uh, for the JCP program itself. And then my personal Twitter is Heather VC. 
So I do both of those. That's where I, I do most of my social media is on Twitter. Um, if you wanted to join us for Code One, that is coming up um, in September in San Francisco, not too far. I just flew from there yesterday. Uh, so what, I think it was three and a half hours and here I am still alive. Uh, made, it, made it, I'll go back, um, be back before work on Monday. So it's a really easy trip, easy to do. Um, I think at this point, uh, gracias. I do have a, <laughs> a few minutes for questions, I think five minutes, if we wanna take uh, a few questions. He's got a question in the back. Yes. for what? I didn't miss. The specifications? Um, no, so the other, the certification is for every version. The, the, the LTS designated designation is really an after the fact thing. So every version of the Java platform has the spec, the RI, and the test suite. So the test suite pertains to the certification, which is your question, do you have certification only for long-term support releases? And no, um, so that remains consistent. Every JSR that goes through the JCP, so every version of the Java platform is required to have all three of those things complete and final before it can be put into any um, shipping product or put into any project in, develop in uh, production. So um, those three things remain consistent over time. Um, the, the LTS de designation is really about kind of after the fact getting support for something once it has become final. Yes, question there. Oh, for the questions, we have t-shirts. Well, I think that each release of Java, whether it's gonna be a long-term support re release or not, 